Cool. All right. Well, I am in Sydney, Australia, and I'm joined by Nathan Hogan from IFIN, IFIN Capital. So welcome on the Rental Journal podcast. Thanks for having me. Amazing. So this is a bit of a weak coincidence. Well, I think you messaged me online and, and said you listen to the podcast and in the industry. And I actually uh, reached out to a few people that I have, I know, and it seems that you are very well connected in the, in the yeah, industry. Yeah, that's right. That's right. We know plenty of good people are in the business. So you obviously have a quite a large network, um, but I'd be interested to understand, I guess, your backstory on how you first got into the equipment rental industry. Yeah, sure. Um, so oh, yeah, I own IFIN Capital along with um, Josh Wheeler, and uh, we've got two sides to our business. We've got a broking house, which is effectively... Um, we look at a lot of equipment finance is our main game. We do a lot of cash flow funding, uh, we do foreign currency, and we do sort of debt advice and debt structuring. The other side of our business is IFIN Advisory, which is an advisory side. So we have uh, stand-in CFO services, uh, we do board advice, special situation advice, and uh, some more sort of debt structuring for at a more senior level uh, on that side of things. So we look at businesses anywhere from mum and dad businesses all the way up to large family businesses, um, all the way through to listed entities. So we mm. cover quite a wide uh, range of clients, I suppose, across the board. Uh, my background with the rental industry is uh, quite long. I, I started back in business banking in 1999 with CBA uh, on the Northern Beaches here in Sydney and um, sort of moved around and uh, went over to NAB and I've worked in lots of different states with NAB in, in equipment finance specifically, um, all the way with corporate institutional banking uh, business banking and the mm. like. Um, and then most recently I was at GE Capital and then I went out broking in 2014. So I was uh, at Australian Structured Finance there for uh, four or so years. And then uh, a bit of structural change there happened and um, there was an opportunity for Josh and I to go out and start IFIN Capital. So we enjoyed that um, and we've been going for nearly five years. So we've got a strong affiliation with uh, the rental industry and, and obviously most... Mm most uh, largely, I suppose, in the equipment finance game. So, so what attracted you to the equipment rental industry then? Uh, I really like uh, the industry itself. It's so vast and there's always something new to learn, uh, as you would know, speaking to many good people. <laughs> but um, the industry itself, it, it's full of great people, uh, but there's so many dynamics to it, uh, whether you're renting out telehandlers or doing super max mining gear, um, all the way down to portaloos and mm. things like that. So there's such a wide variety of things in the rental industry that we can work on and, and obviously look at. And, and it's just getting bigger and bigger every year, yeah? Like it's quite amazing uh, the amount of new businesses that keep popping up. And, and the thing that I really find interesting about the equipment industry is that when a recession is leading up or in a recession, the rental companies usually go okay, if not even better because people's capital is pulled back. They don't want to spend the, the capex on machines and they look at it as alternatives which is rental which is quite an interesting dynamic isn't it yeah 100 percent. i mean um the old saying never waste a crisis i mean th there's always opportunity in the market i think just coming out of COVID and the pandemic the government's committed to a lot of large infrastructure projects um supporting jobs and obviously uh seeing the opportunity to grow at the same time in certain regions and things so those jobs that people are on and new airports, new freeways, new railways, mm. uh, there's so much work out there for rental companies. Um, and it's great to see new participants, but it's also great to see some of the long-standing people continue to grow and, and really f and flourish under the conditions. Yeah. So maybe just for the listeners, for the people that don't understand what a broker is, like when you say that you are a broker in the equipment rental industry, in the finance game, like what does that actually mean? Yeah, so for us, we uh, typically work with clients that are either in a little bit of trouble and need some help or they're really looking to grow and, and their current finance situation uh, is being limited for a, a multitude of reasons. Um, but for us, our, our real strength is um, a lot of people, it's an old cliche, but a lot of people work in the business and not on it. Uh, and a lot of business owners are time poor. So mm. finance brokers like ourselves really add value through um, connecting that business with the right funding solutions and, and really trying to create, you know, better outcomes for the clients. So mm. we always look at um, talking around creating more flexibility uh, and making sure that the client's got a really good runway to where they want to be and how that helps them achieve their goals. It's interesting working in the business rather on the business. I think that's a pretty common trait for most small businesses because they want to keep their fingers on the pulse and they 
the way we want to micromanage yeah, and make right. sure everything happens. But then as soon as they get a little bit of capital and they've got staff that they trust, like they can actually grow so much faster. So it's almost like you don't know what it's like until you get there, but then you don't want to take the risk because you might think your business might fail. It's a bit of an interesting dynamic, I think. Yeah, there's a lot of interesting parts to that. There's, there's businesses that have grown really well naturally and they're at a point where they, they need to take that next step and they're not sure how to take the next step. We can help them do that. Um, but also there's businesses there that are, you know, their business owners might be really good at working on the gear and they really love the equipment and they're the best in the market mm -hmm. of forecasting how to do a project the best way, for example. But on the finance side, they've always just let it happen. Um, and sometimes that can hold you back in the long run. And especially if you're looking to grow and, and have that exponential growth, um, it's definitely super important to have the right finance structure behind mm -hmm. you. And then you mentioned CFO services as well. Like that would obviously be a big thing if someone was sort of relying on a third-party accountant and not really much involved or trying to do it themselves. Uh, I remember I was talking to Gary Radford, who uh, works at Mint up in Queensland, and he was saying that the first key person that he would hire if he start a new business would be to find the right CFO to make sure that they got the streamline, the reporting, all the metrics, all that sort of stuff. So how, how does the, the temporary or the CFO services work? Yeah, so we've got a, a CFO services part of our advisory business. And that really comes into play where uh, a business might need that extra guiding hand or they need a safe pair of hands to help them sort of take those next steps. Uh, we find with a lot of really good family businesses that they love their employees and most of them have been there a long time. Um, but sometimes that can be a limiting factor um, of taking that next step for growth. Uh, and that's where we can come in and help, you know, guide them and, and help them grow in their role as well. Mm. Um, so there's two sides to that. Um, so then we can go to market on their behalf and try and connect them up with what we know is the best solutions in the market for their requirements. And I think it's also flip it the other way because let's say there is a small family business, the, the partners doing the books, they, they, they were threatened if someone else is coming in, but they should see it out the other direction. They can learn from someone that's an experienced CFO and then take those skills and apply it in their own business. So don't, don't see it as a threat, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's definitely not a threat. It's, um, <laughs> it's more of a case of how can we help you really achieve your goals and mm. life in capital in particular, we're really set in our values around having long-term partnerships with our clients. And we, your success is our success. I know that's another cliche, but we really want to make sure that we're um, helping you win all the time. Yeah. Um, and that's one of our main focuses in every conversation we have. And so I was doing a little bit of research on you as well. And so I read that you won Finance Broker of the Year in 2021, which is a pretty amazing achievement. So talk to me about that and then sort of how that felt. Yeah, look, obviously it was a great feeling to win that award. It was really good recognition uh, for our efforts, but also it was really good recognition that we're on the right path uh, and we are genuinely helping clients in the market, especially in the rental industry, where uh, we can help them go to the next stage and, and really help them grow. Um, also, some of the things that don't get recognised is um, obviously with COVID, there was lots of people that had payments on hold and needed restructuring and uh, needed to pull equity out of various things. And we helped a lot of clients do that, uh, which helped them keep their employees, help them keep their houses in some instances, mm. um, and really help them um, reset a platform for growth going forward. And we're really proud to say that a lot of people have come out of the other side and are really starting to excel. So we're really happy with some of the outcomes that we've, we've worked hard on during the pandemic and we're really starting to see the benefit of that now. Yeah, very good. And so I guess looking from the outside in the finance game, like what are some of the challenges or risks you see in the market at the moment? Definitely in the market at the moment, we're seeing uh, a lot of traditional banking relationships being a bit strained. Uh, we're seeing a lot of overreaching from the banks. I think they are getting a little bit nervous around some of the things that are happening. Obviously, Credit Suisse and other things like that are mm, uh, about creating that, yeah. a few shockwaves uh, around the market. So we're seeing a lot of the banks sort of overreaching and, and really looking to, um, I, I suppose they're, they're really looking to gather more security than they need. So they're trying to tie back in family houses. They're trying to get GSAs or a fixed and floating charge over the whole business. Um, they're trying to really look at how much the equity they can put into each deal and things rather than funding 100% of the assets. So in the rental game, mm. obviously most people are highly leveraged. That, that causes some great concern um, especially if one bank has more control than they should, uh, that can be a really limiting factor, especially for the next sort of short-term period, 12 to three years, 12 months to three years, I should say. 
So Bank Swiss, that's an interesting, I was actually at a wedding on the weekend and uh, someone was in the banking game and they mentioned that. I had no idea about that whole scenario, but the, the risk profile went up, I think, to 10%, they mentioned, uh, which is the highest it's, it's ever been. Yeah, they're, they're doing a few funny things behind the scenes. So traditionally, if you're of a business of a decent size, you'd obviously have your historical financials and then you normally have a forecast for the next 12 months at least. Um, and, and based in that, it's really starting to be challenged with the banks. They're, they're sensitizing the forecasts and they're also increasing the interest rate expectation during that period. So it's been well publicized. There's been 10 rate rises in a row, but most of the banks are predicting another two to four rate rises sort of in the next short term, sort of six, six months mm. or so. So um, you can take your pick on who's going to be right, but uh, the overall message is that they're definitely sensitizing those forecasts, which is obviously limiting your ability to borrow more. Yeah. So that obviously for a rental company and people that need gear out there as much as they can, you want them to be able to take those opportunities and having the right finance structure is really important. And I think like when I talk to most rental businesses at the moment, like everyone's doing really well. Everyone's very busy. If we were in the situation now where the interest rates kept on going up, will keep going up and there wasn't many projects, it could be a very dire situation where people wanted to offer their equipment or their the revenue isn't matching the uh, repayments on the machines, all that sort of stuff. So are you having any talk like that or is it everyone's sort yeah, of- Yeah, we're, um, we're having lots of plan discussion around that. Um, when good times are good, it all feels good, but uh, the rainy day is probably just around the corner for some people. Um, and if we always talk about plan A is working really well, what's your plan B and plan C? And when you look at that sort of mindset, um, especially with rental companies where they might have a lot of gear, they might have a lot of gear in one segment of the market, you know, one type of forklift or one type of telehandler, uh, things like that. If all of that got put off work, what would you do? Mm. Uh, lots of owners say, oh, I'll just sell it. But what if there's no market to sell to? Yeah. Or what if it's a limited market? Or a... So we're always talking about making sure you've got the right finance strategies in place, uh, making sure you don't have the family homes and things like that tied in with your personal guarantees. Mm. Um, making sure you have all the right structuring around you and, and have a good runway to make sure you know where you're going to be in the next 12 months. And I think making sure that you've got a clear strategy on your rental rates as well. Uh, you can't be discounting to try and win jobs because you know around the corner there could be a, a finance payment, you get a long-term contract and then the contractor or the customer wants to agree to that price over a long period of time. It just could be a snowball effect. And so, yeah, 100%. 100%. And, and it's so easy, I think, for small businesses just to think, oh, well, we're going to win the jobs, so we're going to discount it. It's not the way to do business. Yeah, we have seen a bit of that lately with um, sort of some signs of people really reducing their, their margins to basically just try and get on a job. Um, and sometimes that's great if it's one or two bits of kit, but if it's a large amount and you haven't got plan B and C ready to go, sometimes that can lead you straight into troubled waters. Yeah. So we really focus on working with all the clients and planning ahead and making sure that we are in a true partnership to say, hey, we, help, we can help you get there, but this is what we would recommend and, mm. and look at alternatives. And I've said this a few times in the podcast, but I'll say it again because it's so important. So let's say you get finance for your 19 foot scissor and you get the rate and you, you know what your rental rate needs to be to pay off that 19 foot scissor. That, that's not how the business works. Like that rental rate isn't paying off that finance agreement. The rental rate is paying for the operations of the entire business, the staff, the overheads, all that sort of stuff, the maintenance, everything. So uh, the, the actual servicing of the machine, uh, all that sort of stuff. So I think making sure that people aren't making, and I really hope this isn't happening, just trying to match the rental rate revenue per month to the finance agreement on the equipment, because that's not how you should be measuring your business. Yeah, that's right. And there's also um, a bit of noise around the market at the moment with some of the clients we're talking to around making sure they've got enough uh, supplies for repairs and maintenance. Uh, obviously, some supply chains are a bit affected at the moment. And mm. People with large fleets in particular, they really should be looking at planning ahead and making sure they've got enough supplies to last for a fair while. Yeah. Um, and I know that means carrying more overhead and carrying more stock, but that's actually a safety net as opposed to your competitors who may not be doing that. Um, it might give you an upper hand down the track. Um, yeah, it might switch people to do more external servicing as well, to the, rely on those ex external contracts and not manage the stock on their actual books rather than uh, external. But it'll be interesting to see with that. Yeah, that's right. And obviously with lots of work comes lots of hours, which means more maintenance. So mm. if those parts are, are getting short in supply and things, you definitely want to be looking around the corner and making sure 
you've got enough um, ready to go so your fleet can have no down days effectively and yeah. still be working. And so in the market at the moment, what sort of loans are you writing? Uh, we're doing quite a fair bit of variant stuff at the moment. We've just been mandated to do $30 million worth of ultra-class mining gear to go to an iron ore mine over in WA. Um, just last week, we funded uh, a whole bunch of machines in the materials handling space. So we did a bunch of telehandlers and uh, a couple of scissors, which was quite nice. Uh, just yesterday, we financed a couple of trucks for a subcontractor um, in the refrigeration space. So there's lots happening and then... Alternative to that, a director called this morning saying he wants a new uh, Ford Ranger. So um, <laughs> we do sort of all sorts. So yeah. that sort of shows you the wide range that we can handle. Yeah. Um, but definitely in the rental space, there's so much activity. There's there's lots happening out there. Mm. And so before the podcast, when we were chatting, you actually mentioned that Tom Trebojevic, it's a tough last name, uh, joined Ifin Capital. So how did how did that come about? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, it's, it's great to have him on board. It was a good opportunity at the time. Um, and we've really started to flourish under that relationship, which has been good. Um, part of IFIN Capital's values is we do a bit in the community. So we sponsor community sport and uh, we have a few charity days a year and we do a few things um, just part of our values of what we do. And part of that is we sponsor my old uh, football club, the Monoval Raiders, where I used to play as a kid. Uh, and Tom's family was all part of that as well. Uh, the same club and uh, just happened to be a sponsor's event at the right time and um, Tom's father asked if we'd have an interest in um, helping him out, seeing if he could uh, do a bit of work in the finance game because he's got a keen interest in it. Yeah. Um, and it sort of just flourished from there. So a week later we had breakfast and here we are. <laughs> nice. And so what's his role? Uh, so football's obviously his predominant role, um, but with us he's definitely learning the ropes. So he's uh, learning how to read financials and understand the rental game in particular. Um, and he's also really starting to um, get out and talk to clients. So we've taken him out to lots of client meetings and trying to get him to understand different industries and different risks in different industries and really get a, uh, a real wholesome sort of helicopter view mm. of all these different industries and markets to increase his education uh, as, he is, as he keeps growing. Very good. And so what's the plan ahead for the next year or so for IFIN Capital? Uh, we've got lots of plans um, coming up this year. We're looking at expanding a little bit further. We've got an office in Queensland. Uh, there's an opportunity in the short term there to maybe move down to Adelaide too uh, and start an office there, which is exciting. Um, and we've got a whole bunch of customer events coming up. we are uh, booked in at Newcastle in the Hunter. Um, we've got one in the Gold Coast, one in Brisbane. We've got one in Darwin um, booked as well. Um, so, yeah, we're, we've got uh, a really good footprint happening at the moment. So all those events are sort of scheduled out from between now and the end of June. Um, we're talking about the economy and, and the markets. Um, it's a bit of networking, mm. uh, but also the instant asset write-off, uh, which is huge in the higher game. That's actually ending at June 30 this year. Um, so definitely should be speaking to your accountants or your CFOs or uh, planning ahead around what you can do between now and then to obviously have the best tax-effective mm. strategy on that one. And then just, uh, I want to try and find some advice for uh, owners of businesses as well. So if someone's feeling like they're in a bit of trouble at the moment from the finance side, um, what would you recommend to them? Yeah, trouble or growth, um, they sort of fall into the same category for us at the moment. Um, definitely reach out to us. That's, that's obviously a big one. Uh, we're more than happy to help and have a confidential conversation. But more importantly, I, I think it's about having, making sure you've got some clear set goals and timelines and parameters around what you're looking to achieve. Um, there's people at the moment that are, uh, if they're in a bit of trouble or they're over leveraged and they're having trouble with utilization rates or something might not be working the best way, uh, it could. There's definitely plenty of people out there that can help. Um, so don't feel like you're all on your own, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and in particular, if you're having trouble with a bank or a lender, there's lots of opportunity out there. It's a matter about finding the right people and connecting. Um, so with our ability to have a large market share and our market buying power um, and our negotiations with all those different lenders, we can definitely try and help you find a solution. Very good. And finally, we always ask this question. So how do you define success? Yeah, defining success is obviously a broad, uh, broad topic. Um, but for me, we're, f we're really a uh, customer first approach type of business. So that's one of our key values. So we're always defining success by what our customers say about us. And we get so much word of mouth referral. Uh, we get referrals for family members, for business owners. And that's, so that's always a really good judge for us. But we've, as we said, we've helped people in trouble this year. We've helped people in growth. So we've been lucky enough to really see all sides of the market this year. 
Um, and that obviously makes me more individually more well-rounded and, and keeps increasing our skills as well. So defining success, I'm obviously striving to be a better father, a better husband, and um, obviously a better broker. Very, so. very good. All right, well, thank you for coming on the Rental Journal podcast. No, thanks for having us. It's been great.